Amen. So before we get into Joel, I'd like to just read 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us this. It says, all Scripture. I want to have you repeat back the words, all Scripture. Maybe later on in the message when we get a little more excited, but all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What inspiration of God means is that it's God-breathed, right? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, says that what we hold in our hands is not what, something that came about from just a private interpretation, uh, just a bunch of people deciding they would give us a message and then mark it with all these dates to make you think it's really ancient when it's really not. What we hold in our hands is not of any private interpretation, but holy men were moved by God's Spirit. God's Spirit, all Scripture is God-breathed. And it says that it's profitable. God's Word is profitable, and it's going to go into a list of all of the things God's Word is profitable for, but, but really it's saying it's profitable for everything, right? We're going to read a list of, of some four things, but what it's really saying is God's Word is God-breathed, this does not contain the Word of God. Every word here is the Word of God. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it is profitable for everything. You know, the trap we can fall into is by the way we react to the Word of God, by the way we can distance ourselves from the Word of God, by the way we can always find ourselves too busy for the Word of God, we can act as though it says, you know, all Scripture might be profitable. And the way some believers run from the word, you might think that it said all, all scripture is, is, is negative. <laughs> all scripture is not here to bless you. It says here all scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable. And then it tells you what it's profitable for. It says it's profitable for doctrine. Doctrine, it means you can, by reading the word of God, you can know the doctrine, right? The teaching, you can know the teachings of God, know the heart of God, and say, okay, I know who I am, I know my standing. I will not be moved from knowing who I am in Christ and knowing who Christ is. That's doctrine. The word of God gives you your doctrine, right? It's not based on what you feel, it's what you know, right? Sometimes you don't feel washed clean, but it's what you know. It's not based on what you feel. Sometimes you don't feel like a daughter of the Most High God. Sometimes you don't feel like the apple of his eye. But doctrine, the Word of God is here to give you doctrine so you know, right? Because our heart is deceitful. We don't go by feelings, right? We walk by faith, not by feelings. We walk by faith in what God says. Scripture is given for doctrine. I'm going to skip over, because I'm going to come to this word last, but let's just skip over and go to the next one. All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's given for correction. Correction means that you were thinking a wrong way, and the Word of God came along and tweaked your thinking. Oh, wow, I thought you could lose your salvation. But the Scripture says, John 6, 37, and many other places, that if you truly are His, He will never cast you out. Once saved, you really are always saved. Aha! I'm corrected in my thinking. It's given for correction. Oh, wow. You know, okay, I get it. The same way I came to the Lord empty-handed, relying solely on his grace to be saved is the same way I come to the Lord empty-handed, relying solely on his grace to receive the Holy Spirit day by day. I'm I don't have to earn it or barter with God for a daily filling of the Spirit. I get it. That's correction. Then it says, lastly, instruction in righteousness. Oh, the Word of God gives me detail, jot and tittle detail on how to live a moral life, a righteous life in a slippery world. It allows me to walk a walk that makes even the greatest secular moralist have to say, whoa, you know, where do you get your wisdom? We love all of that, don't we? Don't we? But there's one word that we left out. We see that all Scripture is profitable. We see that it's given for doctrine. Oh, we love that. Give me more doctrine. Oh, you know, my mind, I, I didn't begin to use my mind until I got into Scriptures. Give me more of that. I, that's brain food. I love doctrine. How many here love doctrine? Amen. 
you know? Correction. Oh, yeah. Sometimes wrong thinking can cause a lot of unnecessary migraines. Oh, I love correction. So I love that it's given for doctrine. I love that it's given for correction. And then lastly, instruction in righteousness. Woo! Yeah, I, I'm going to be walking here as a pilgrim until the Lord calls me home or until that rapture trumpet blows. I love that there's daily instruction on how to navigate the home, how to navigate the job, how to navigate the local church and everywhere else. We love all of those. But where do you hear people saying, hey, you know what? You know what? There's one word, reproof. What reproof means is rebuke. Rebuke. You know, oh, you know what, man? I hope I go to church today and get a, a word of rebuke, right? But it says that all Scripture is profitable. It's profitable for everything and along with doctrine, we need that. Along with correction, we need that. Along with instruction and in righteousness, we need that. It's also rebuke, and we need that. But you see, the trap today that we have to watch out for is the 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 trap, where it says in the last days, people won't want to hear that. It says people will have itching ears and they will raise up preachers, maybe who will just give them, we think, oh, oh that, that applies to the heresy stuff. I can never fall in that trap. That applies to the whack teaching. Oh, I know that a mile away. Oh, what if it's just even referring to the teaching uh, that's just all doctrine, just all how to live a moral life, and just no rebuke, no thus saith the Lord, nothing. No talking about sin, no talking about repentance. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 10, because we know there's nothing new under the sun. Even in Isaiah's day, they said, don't tell us right things. Don't tell us where we're wrong. Just tell us smooth things. And the reality is this, is that many churches today, they're handing out doctrine. They're handing out instruction and in righteousness. They're even handing out correction, but they're holding back teachings on rebuke. And all of us can fall into that trap if we're not careful, because that's the climate. We live in the day, you know, where every kid gets a trophy, you know, one kid, you know, come, comes to one practice, and the one practice the kid came to, he was 30 minutes late, never even showed up to a game, but the family wants that trophy, and that's the culture, and if we think that's not uh, affecting the church, uh, and even uh, dictating the way a lot of church culture is going, then we're deceived, but in the midst of all of this, God has his way. God is never baffled by the times. There are no times that ever checkmate God. God is always moving. His spirit is moving, and he's given us his word, and it does well to us to make sure that when we want to have holistic Bible study, systematic Bible study, we want to make sure that we don't just go after doctrine, uh, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And we treat it like, you know, basically like a salad bar Christianity where it's like, you know, you leave all the vegetables. You know, you ever go to the buffet and all you ate was just meat and gravy and dessert? And someone look at your plate, they think there's no vegetables there. And the way some people read the Bible, you think the Bible has no rebuke in it. We need it. We need it. And remember, the Lord says this in Revelation chapter 3, when I rebuke you, it's because I love you. The way a father shows his love for his children is to chasten them to discipline them. And the chief way the Lord looks to discipline us is through his word. Joel comes in now. Turn to the book of Joel. Joel comes in as this very interesting guy, and he is coming with some rebuke. In fact, he, Hosea, and Amos uh, were actually contemporaries. It's believed that they prophesied in like the ninth century um, and basically, perhaps, they surmise it was in, during the reign of Uzziah. So they say it seems to be around in, in the 800s, okay? Joel, his name means the Lord is God. I mean, his name alone is just like, whoa, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, Jonah comes on the scene. Jonah's name means dove in Hebrew. So it's like, all right, he's coming with some realness, but, you know, his name means dove, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, or Daniel, you know, comes on the scene. His name means God is judge. Uh, Joel comes on the scene. It just means the Lord is God. It's like, whoa. You know, you ever just, you know, when you just hear someone say, like, God is God. God is God. And it's like, just some, sometimes it takes a few words uh, and God being mentioned a lot in one sentence that just really kind of wakes you up. Joel's name wakes you up, the name alone, right? I mean, just say it to yourself in your head. The Lord is God. 
Yahweh is God. Doesn't it already just kind of just cause you to just sit up like, like attention a little bit, right? It's hard to say, you know, the Lord is God and Jesus is my homeboy, like in the same, in the next breath, isn't it? Right? Yeah, because we start, you know, we, that familiarity breeds contempt. Our, that's what our wicked heart does. But you come and say, the Lord is God. It's like, whoa. Wow. Okay, let's, 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 let's read. It's believed that Joel, like he just pops on the scene like an Elijah. It's believed that he was either a farmer or a herdsman because his insight into like agriculture is crazy, right? Um, let's read. And basically, before we read, let me just share a couple things with you. He's describing, and it's deep, it's deep, because if you look at our 2020, and you look at the book of Joel, the parallels are unbelievable. Basically, a national calamity has fallen upon Israel. That national calamity caused a complete emotional train wreck in the hearts of people. The church was affected. Israel was affected. The temple was affected. So he's writing about this locust plague. Now here, you know, don't even get it twisted for a minute and just look at our little punk cicadas and think that, you know, a locust plague is just like an innumerable amount. Of, how many of you know what the cicadas are? Right? And how many of you fall in the trap that when we talk about a locust plague, you're like, oh yeah, just a bunch of them. Oh man, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Let me tell you what, if you really know what locusts do in these regions where they come in such hordes, 20 miles wide, that they blot out the sun when they come, the last thing you'd be worried about is, is whether they wake you up at five in the morning. They decimated everything. Then they died. And before the next wave would come, the stench of the death, it, it changed everything. And we're going to read, it's going to say that the land was like the Garden of Eden. And when they would come, it would look desolate. So desolate, brush fires and fires would begin. So you have this locust plague, which caused a famine. You know, today, you know, my garden in the back get hit, no problem, I'll go to the grocery store. So in our day, imagine if locusts went in grocery stores and ate all the groceries. Imagine if locusts went in the banks and ate all your bank, everything in your bank account. And, and went all in your, in, your, in your digital bank account and ate up all your electronic funding. And there was nothing you could hide from them. Now are you beginning to understand what locusts do? See, because we, you know, just because you got a little tomato plant and, you know, you woke up and it was uh, rotted out in the sun, you know, that's your hobby. You know, this was their everything. So let's see. This is what's going to happen. And we're going to read now. It is a national disaster. And let's make the parallels with 2020. Because here's the thing. In the midst of this, God has a prophetic word for the people. In the midst of our 2020, God has a prophetic word. In Joel's day, it was a national disaster that had and came with it emotional, uh, deep emotional fallout. And the economy was so messed up that the temple services were impacted. And God has a prophetic word in the midst of that. The marriages were affected. The marriage ceremonies were affected in Joel's day. We're going to see that. The livestock, the animals were affected. Everything was affected. And it was getting worse. God comes with a prophetic word. Write down in your notes, we always need a prophetic word. We need a prophetic word. And remember, prophecy isn't just foretelling, meaning uh, the Bible tells things before they happen. That's only one part of prophecy. The other part is forthtelling. There's foretelling, F-O-R-E, telling things before it happens. Oh, the Bible does plenty of that. But it also is forthtelling, F-O-R-T-H. It means what is God, what's on God's heart and mind right now? 
So when we say we need a prophetic word, it's not just a matter of, oh, we need someone to tell us when COVID will be over. We need someone to tell us, you know, what's going to, no, it's a matter of what's God saying in the midst of it right now, okay? In Joel's day, you had optimists who were saying, you know what, man, locust plagues are a part of life and things will get better. In Joel's day, you had pessimists saying, this is it. It's over. It's curtains, right? In Joel's day, you had alarmists who were seeing a locust behind every tree. And then Joel comes on the scene as a realist. That's what the church needs right now. Because even in our day, how similar is it in our COVID culture, right? Uh, where everything has been affected in just the same way as in Joel's day. A national calamity that has completely uh, depleted people emotionally, that has affected economy, that even has affected uh, worship in the local church. We're going to read in our same day. You have optimists. Just saying like, hey, you know what? Um, everything's going to be just fine uh, because God's sovereign, right? You have pessimists. Uh, you know, man, the church isn't going to make it through this. Uh, you have alarmists. Uh, oh my gosh, you know, uh, everybody's got COVID, you know, uh, and don't get near me. Don't touch me. Don't even look at me. I might get it if you look at me. And then God's looking for realists, and the realists are the ones that say, what is God saying? What is God saying right now? And isn't it interesting that in, even in the midst of it, if you just see how much the church is so content to just have just doctrine, correction, and instruction in righteousness, just survey the American church. Where are people even asking for a prophetic word? Where do you even hear people saying, what is God saying? All people just want to just be reminded of that, oh, yeah, Psalm 91, 10,000 will fall on your right hand, but it shall not come nigh. Praise God, that is in the Bible, right? But where are people saying, what's God saying to the church? Pastor, what's God saying to the church in 2020? What do you think is the Lord saying to us right now? We should be conditioned to want a prophetic word. What is God saying to us? Spiritual people in the scriptures knew that no matter what went down, God was communicating something. God was communicating something to Israel with a locust plague. God's communicating something to us with COVID. So it's deeper than just, is God bigger than COVID? That's, that's one-on-one Christianity. It even gets into what's God saying because he's bigger than COVID. What's he saying in the midst of this? You ready to read? Let's read. Write this down first. Um, three words. The, therefore, and then. That's how you could divide up uh, the two chapters we're going to look at today. The, Therefore, and then. And why don't we do this too? Whenever you're going to journey through a book of the Bible, I would recommend that you always look for a pivotal verse, a key verse. Every book of the Bible, I believe, has a verse that says it all. Just like every movie has a scene, that to know the scene is to get so much of what there is, I believe every book has a verse. The verse here, why don't you just turn, please, real quick to Joel 2, uh, and why don't you look at verse 12. And it's really, I believe, uh, Joel 2, 12, and 13. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments, meaning don't just do the display. It was an oriental custom to rip your clothing when you were showing that you were so sorry about something. He's saying, actually rip your heart. Don't just, rip, don't just go through the motions. Really mean it. Rip your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God. And you ready? Here it is. Underline this. Get excited about this. For he is gracious. <laughs> he is merciful. He is slow to anger. He is of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. I believe that is the key pivotal verse. And then there's another one as well. Look at chapter 2, verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. Underline this. That has dealt wondrously with you. 
God is gracious. God is of great kindness. God gives us rebukes because he wants to deal wonderfully with us. Now, here's where we can often go wrong. You see, when the Lord was really beginning to put this message on my heart, he was putting on my heart Joel 2.25. And every week I'm praying, pray for me, I'm praying. Lord, what do your people need to hear? What do your people need to hear? What do your people need to hear? All week long, no matter what's going on, what do your people need to hear? Laughing at a movie, but in their mind, what do your people need to hear? That's just the life of a pastor. And he put Joel 2.25. You guys know the verse. Let's read it together. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, that the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. You guys know that verse, right? How many of you, you, you we, that, yo, that is a beautiful verse. He just said that everything that has been eaten up, I will give back to you, right? So then this would be the great verse to end a year with. Matter of fact, I'm convinced that a lot of churches will be using this in either today's message or the New Year's Eve service or whatever or next Sunday's message. It's just a great promise, isn't it? Because how, what a more fitting year than this year where you could just look at just what has been gobbled up. Time with loved ones. How many of you just couldn't even visit, I couldn't visit my own mom because she's immunocompromised. You know, I mean, you could just, you, I mean, could, was there ever a year when you could make a longer list of the things that COVID has eaten up? Locusts were that in his day, in our 2020, our locust is COVID, if you will, right? So isn't it so fitting that when you read a verse like Joel 2.25, you're like, I mean, isn't it a verse to get pumped about? That God is so good, you know, he's of great kindness. We saw that in Joel chapter 2, verse uh, 13. Um, He's merciful. Um, And then we see that in verse, what, 20, um, what was that that we read? 26, that he he wants to deal wondrously with us. Wow, all you got to do is read those two verses, and then you come back and say, yeah, he's going to give me back what the canker worm has devoured. He's going to give me back what the locusts have eaten up. What it means is missed harvest. Harvest is a time of joy. Harvest is a time of celebration. I will give you back missed joy. I will give you back joy you've been robbed of. I will give you back celebrations you've been robbed of. I will give you back harvest you've been robbed of. It's a supernatural mystery that he says he will do. Now, y'all know this verse, don't you? And it should get you excited. But if you study the two chapters before that verse, it's conditional. And while this verse is taught a lot, is it always taught that it's conditional? Nah, pastor, it ain't conditional. No, I I know ministries that that I've been following before you were born. And they get up and they just say, if you read it and you believe it and you say that he's going to give me back what the canker worms devoured, and if you believe it and hallelujah it, that you're going to have that. Let me ask you a question. If it's not conditional, then why are so many believers walking around like they're in the desert? If it's not conditional, why are so many believers walking around with no joy, no zeal, no passion, no brokenness, no humility to want to serve? Don't even know how to say sorry to somebody. If it's not conditional, why is it so hard to find someone walking in it? Hallelujah. It's conditional. Let's read. Joel chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? He's unpacking something so unheard of. He's unpacking the locust plague, and he's saying, is there anything you can compare to this? And look at our 2020. If, is, is there anyone, have you shared this, that we would be in a day where it would be this and all of this happening? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the store, about to go in the grocery store yesterday, and you know, when you pull your car up, someone's car is pulled up next to you, and, and I was just watching this person in their car, just mask, face shield, You know, it's like they were like afraid of catching it from themselves, you know, and disinfecting everything. I'm just sitting, I'm like, 
did, what? And, and then I just began to pray for her because I could see the, just the spirit of fear owning her. And it was like, what times are we in? Well, it says here, talking about the same day, it's saying, has there ever been a day like this? Joel says, verse 3, tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. He's about to unpack the unheard of locust plague that has just swept through the land. Uh, and of course, we're making the parallels with the unheard of year called 2020, right? It says, verse 4, that which the palmer worm has left, the locust has eaten. That which the locust has left, the canker worm has eaten. That which the canker worm has left, the caterpillar has eaten. Basically, people look at this in all different ways. Some people have said, oh, this is just, you may read some commentaries and it'll say, this is just symbolic of just sin and it really shows how sin comes in and destroys everything. Very true, but this actually was. This was a very real locust plague. And it seems to be describing here the larval stages of just all of these different crop devouring moths right verse 5 awake ye drunkards weep and howl all ye drinkers of wine because of the new wine for it is cut off from your mouth this had completely decimated the economy uh you can't make wine and no one can drink if there's no grapes there was nothing and what he's saying is awake he's calling people to wake up out of their slumber. What the church needs to do right now is wake up out of its slumber. Verse 6, for a nation is come upon my land. The locust plague was so bad, here it's being compared to a nation. Now, mind you, you may read different commentaries that say this wasn't a real locust plague, this was just sin. And the army he's talking about are the Assyrians. No, 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 listen, the Assyrians are coming. But this is not referring to the Assyrians. This is all about this locust plague. He's likening them to an army. And actually, let's read verse 6. A nation is come upon my people, strong and without number, whose teeth are like the teeth of a lion, and he that has the cheek teeth of a great lion. Even the molar teeth basically are like that of a lion. Verse 7. He has laid my vine waste he has barked my fig tree, meaning stripped, not just eaten the fruit and the leaves, stripped the bark off of it. He has made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches are made white. As another description, go to chapter 2 really quick. And let's read this other description. Verse 4 of chapter 2. The appearance of them is like the appearance of horses, and as a horseman they run. Like the noise, verse 5, of chariots on the tops of mountains will they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people fall and be much pained, and all faces will gather blackness, speaking of famine that comes. They will run like mighty men. They will climb the wall like men of war. They will march everyone on his ways. They will not break their ranks. <laughs> Neither will one thrust another. They will walk everyone in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they will not be wounded. They will run to and fro in the city. They will run upon the wall. They will climb up upon the houses. They will enter in at the windows like a thief the earth will quake before them the heavens will tremble the sun and the moon will be dark and the stars will withdraw their shining and the lord will utter his voice before his army here's what's interesting this locust plague is being referred to as god's army that's what's deep what that forces us to realize is that while god is not the author of evil nothing can happen without god's permission God permits things. God has permitted this locust plague upon his people. And what the church actually needs to begin to say as we review 2020 is, why has God allowed COVID upon the church? You see, a lot of times we're asking the wrong questions or we're asking just very shallow, secular questions, but someone truly thinking and understanding who God is, you begin to ask the question, what are you saying to the church in the midst of this? Write this in your notes. It is well worth having your years eaten up of locusts to have a message sent to us like the message of Joel. It is well worth having 
our years eaten up by locusts to have a message sent to us like the book of Joel. What Joel does is shares the ways of God and how he wakes his people up and gets his people back to meaning business. Let's go back to chapter 1. Verse 8, lament. Do you see the first thing he says in verse 5 is wake up. How much the church is sleeping today. The second thing he says is lament. Actually be broken about it. But not just a matter of, you know, 60 minutes of being broken while the preacher is preaching. It tells you what kind of lamenting. Look at this. Like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. He's saying lament like a newly married bride that just lost her husband. Look at this, verse 9. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. You see, not all of the sacrifices brought to the altar were animal sacrifices. Along with them was drink offerings. Along with them was grain offerings. But when the locusts have now eaten up all of the economy, there's no grain offering. Do you get it? That's what they were going through. More so, the priests did not get honorarium checks. The priests, their income was getting a piece of the offering you brought. So if the economy is eaten up by locusts and there's no more grain, then people aren't bringing grain to the temple. If they're not bringing the grain to the temple, then the priests are not even getting paid. Do you see what's happening? How similar is this to what we're going through in 2020? This should blow you away by this point as you're starting to realize, but it should also cause you to fall more in love with the Word of God and say, whoa, just when I feel like the, just when I thought Daniel rocked me, just when I think Revelation is rocking me, here comes this obscure book in the middle of the Bible that comes in and it's like it's talking to me right now. It's like it was written yesterday. Look at how in Joel's day it was an economy and even the local church, even the temple was affected. Look at today. How many churches are the priests mourning because bills aren't getting paid? Because if people are laid off, you think of reading an article about not just people losing jobs, entire careers have disappeared. Performers, actors, this, entire careers. And how many local churches are there where the offerings have tanked so much that now the priests are mourning, the economies. Do you see how applicable this is to our day? Yeah, in Joel's day, God allowed a locust plague to wake his people up. It's just a matter right now, faith or not faith, do we believe that God, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he's allowed COVID to communicate something to his church? Verse 10, the field is wasted. The land mourns. The corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ashamed. First he says, wake up. Then he says, lament. Then he says, be ashamed. Be ashamed, O ye husbandmen, how ye vine dressers, the wheat, the barley. Wheat and barley is like the basics. The basic thing, like if nothing grows, barley will grow. They devoured everything because of the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up. The fig tree languishes. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree, everything is withered. And then what does it say here? Look at this. Because of all of this national calamity, what happens now? The priests are mourning, the temple's affected, church service is affected. What now happens now? Look at this last line of verse 14. Joy is withered away from the sons of men. There's an emotional impact. You realize when you read this, it is uncanny how similar this story is with our 2020. National calamity, emotional impact. How deep has the emotional impact of 2020 been? Local churches affected, offerings affected, wow. And then he gives a solution. Gird yourselves. And he, now he's beginning. A physician doesn't just diagnose the problem. A physician begins to give the remedy. Gird yourselves. What it's saying is this. As Old Testament believers, there was only one day when it was mandatory to fast, and that was the Day of Atonement. But when there was a sense of something really serious going on, you fasted. And he says here, gird yourselves. What it means here is 
put on sackcloth, which is burlap, the material that they make potato sacks out of, put on sackcloth, it is time to get on your faces. That is what he's saying. How ye ministers at the altar. Look at what he says here. Lie all night. This is very convicting. Very convicting, isn't it? But see, remember, he's telling you how to get the years back. He's going to tell you how to get the harvest back. Let me ask a question. I don't got to ask you how jacked up your 2020's been. I don't got to ask you how much, if you had a million guesses, you would have never guessed a year like this year. But who's ready? Who wants spiritual renewal in the midst of it? Who wants real revival in the midst of it? Who wants to really come out on top out of this thing? Who really wants to see the supernatural in this thing? Who really is going to do business and really look at their heart and say, you know what? I'm drawing some lines. I'm going to be broken. I'm going to be changed by God. Because it says again in chapter 2, right, verse 27, uh, or rather verse 26, he, he wants you to say, my God is done wondrously with me who wants to and and this is way deeper than a message to just get you all hype you know pastors know how to do that you're coming at the end of the year you bring in some killer verse like Joel 225 get people hype you know no, no who actually wants to live hype not just get hype live hype he's going to tell you how to get there but remember it is conditional he's telling you what to do Wake up, lament, gird yourself. He's telling the leadership, and this is convicting. Pray for leaders of the church. Pray for the leaders of the church. Lie all night in sackcloth. Lie all night. Verse 14, call for a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Then is saying, now leadership, now that y'all done, let the word just fillet you. Now call the whole church together. Interesting, there's no little asterisk and on the bottom it says, yeah, but you know, a lot of people don't want to come to church no more. People made bad habits and this and this and this and that. You know, there comes a time where you just see what the word of God is saying and you do, God, one thing about God is he knows what we're all able to do. That's what I love about the Lord. I love how it even says in the scriptures, you know, give unto God as he has prospered you. You know, giving and our our tithing, it's a personal thing. God knows what we're able to do. And even here, he knows what each of us is able to do. Pastors need to be careful. You don't want to just make this big guilt trip. Then the ones who really can't feel guilty, they already feel guilty enough. No, but God knows what everyone's able to do. He knows who could be here. He knows who could be in the house of God. He knows who, who really don't care. He says, call, call a fast, call an assembly. One thing you read in this is that no matter what we do with church culture, God is still into his people getting together. No matter what new normals and what new comfort zones we've created, because we are amazing at making comfort zones in America, God, God's still into his people coming together. Are you still into coming together with the people of God? Or are you like Ghostface Killer from Wu-Tang Clan when he first came out? If you don't know that, forget it. Sanctify a fast, call them a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land. Call them where? To the house of the Lord your God. You come back to saying, man, it's not just my church. No, it's the house of the Lord God. What does Joel's name mean? The Lord is God. Wow, verse 16, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of God. Again, look at the parallels. Chapter 1, verse 16 is saying, yo, there's even a difference when we go to church. That's what was happening in their day. It was in the, the economy was affected. There was emotional impact. It affected the service, uh, the priests. It affected their wages. Everyone is scrambling. Everyone is scratching their head. And then look at this, verse 16. It's not joy and gladness even missing from the church. Whoa. But the thing is, in the midst of all of this, God has something to say. Psalm 100 says that coming to church is supposed to be a joyous thing. Enter into his gates with what? With thanksgiving. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. But how much can we continue the parallels? Wow. Even today, walk in and wow, you got you to gotta make sure that you're in the spirit because wow, you can be coming in. How many of you would be very honest to say, yeah, when I come to church now, joy and gladness isn't in my heart. Joy and gladness isn't in my heart. There's a lot of things in my heart, mostly distractions, a lot of idols, but joy and gladness isn't one of them. I just go and hope I get a word. Well, the Lord's saying that's a problem. That's all part of the problem. 
It is a desolation that's hit the land, and what it actually is pointing to is a desolation. See, God will sometimes bring a change on the external to really show you what's going on on the internal. When he allows the locusts to come and eat up the land, he's showing them where their hearts have been. When God, COVID did not create anything, all COVID did was just show people where their hearts were. If you don't come to church during COVID, it shows you ain't never like coming to church that much. If you don't gather with saints, yeah, if you don't want to serve now, you never like serving anyway. If you don't want to give the homeless and you're not thinking, who's out there hungry? Who's out there? You know, you know, COVID just reveals where your heart's been. It didn't make your heart that. It's just a litmus test. And that's what he's doing here with the people. He's showing them they had so much going on, they couldn't really get it. So what does he do? He brings a locust plague to say, this is some stuff we got to talk about. This is where your heart is. And, 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 and because we're thick-skulled, God has to really sometimes communicate to us really loud. How many of you realize that, that you've got the thickest skull you know? I'm the only one that thinks that. I'm hard-headed. I'm, I got a thick skull. You, you know, I was that neighborhood kid. Yeah, he's got a thick skull. You, you, oh, they ain't say that about you. Oh, God, you, you'll learn. You just keep breathing. You'll learn. Better you learn sooner than later, though. But anyway, but God knows how to communicate to us, right? Look at this, verse 18. How do the beasts groan? The herds of the cattle are perplexed. They have no pasture. The flocks and the sheep are made desolate. You see, I remember when COVID happened. It's so crazy. Here he's talking about a famine that's affected temple worship. It has affected the joy in temple worship. It has affected the economy. It has affected the economy of the pastors. It says now the animals are even mourning. And I remember when we were all first home, our dogs were thrown off. Even the dogs were affected. You're like, wow, the parallels here are crazy. You remember our dogs be fighting for no reason at first. Just be fighting going to the bathroom in the house. It's like the dogs knew something was wrong. It's like everything got shook up. That's what's happening in Joel's day. Verse 19, O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire has devoured the pastures. You see, not only did the, the um, crop destruction come from the locusts, but then it left such a wilderness that now brush fires are beginning. Drought is there. All of this has followed. Chapter 2, blow ye the trumpet of Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes. It is nigh at hand. You're going to see a lot of interplay between what appears to be like a coming judgment of God, uh, the second coming of Christ in, in judgment, the Assyrians. All of this kind of interplays where it's just speaking of basically it can get worse is really what it's communicating. It can get worse. That's why a lot of people are like, oh, 2020, yeah, I need this out of my way. 2021, come on. You, you asking for 2021, like you know for a fact it's not going to be worse than 2020. We have no idea what's coming, but what we do need to do is get quiet before the one who does. 2021 could be a year to make you wish you could go back to 2020. We don't know. Make you be crying for 2020. Make 2020 look like vacation. We don't know. We do know this, though, that he that's on the throne is our father and that he has promised to keep us in perfect peace as our minds are stayed on him. You know, you're going to start to see a chasm. You're going to start to see a chasm develop on not just between who teaches heresy and who loves sound Bible teaching. No, within people that love sound Bible teaching, you're going to see a chasm of those that really grab hold of God and his word and those that play loosey-goosey. You're going to see a difference, and that difference is going to get bigger. A difference in zeal, zeal versus not zeal, peace versus not peace, loving others versus not loving others. The chasm is going to get big within Bible believing, rebuke you, quote Bible verse, commentaries lining your, your living room, Christianity. This is a day where God is really calling us. Who's, who really wants to mean business for me now? And the day is going to reveal it. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. And he wants you, what? To be able to say, Joel 2, 26. The Lord my God has dealt wondrously with me. Why does he allow all this to happen? Because he wants you to realize you're helpless. He wants you to cast away everything that gets in the way. Repent of everything that's been clouding it up. And to grab a hold of him. So he, God is a blessing God. And he wants to bless us so much that he will even allow locusts 
disease, war, evil, to happen to wake us up. There's two types of storms that could come in a believer's life. There's storms of correction, meaning there's no sin you've really done, but it's just to mature you and take you deeper. Jesus said, the tree that brings forth fruit, he'll cut you back so you could be even more fruitful. Storms of correction. You search your heart, <clears throat> nothing major to really repent of. You're, you're in the local church. You're plugged in. You're in the word. You're accountable. You know, you're close with your leadership. You know what I mean? You're, you're really seeking to do his will. So, it's, you know, you check your own heart in the private world. Okay, this is a storm of correction. God's doing this because he just wants to grow me and he wants to keep me blessable. But then there's storms of correction. The first one is a storm of perfection. Let me make that clear. That's a storm of perfection, rather. Meaning it's, the storms just come to perfect you. But then there's storms of correction, where God has allowed a storm into your life to show you that there's something you really need to repent of. And if we don't repent of it, and we want to run from him, we're, the temperature only turns up. Why don't you turn to Amos chapter 5, verse 19. It's amazing, right? We read that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. The Bible says so much on rebuke. But isn't it something that in this day of wanting to hear smooth words, right? Look at Amos chapter 5, verse 19. This is, from the, this is for the part of our heart that thinks you can out-hustle God, that you can outlast God, that you can out pouty face, fold your arms, catch an attitude with God. This is for, the, for that part of our heart that feels that way. It says this, Amos chapter 5, verse 19. It is as if a man ran from a lion and a bear met him. Or as if he went out into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Yo, when God wants to turn it up on you, and God is turning up the temperature on the church, there will be those that think they can shimmy, shimmy, ah, and hustle and sidestep away from what God is doing, and because all your life you've just kind of hustled your hustle. But it says you will be like the one that dodges the lion and the bear's right there. Woo, got away from the bear. Woo, let me catch a breather on the wall. Bayow, snake bit your hand. Go to Haggai. This is for the person that thinks that just because you got some money in the bank, you'll be all right. Haggai chapter 1. Verse 6, he says, okay, you think you're just going to run into your business world and hide from me there? Verse 6, you've sown much, bring in little. Don't you realize I'm the one that makes that thing work? You eat, but you don't have enough. Oh, this is for the person who thinks that just, you know, have a little glass of wine at night just helps you deal with your problems. Just pour your sorrows into a little crushed grapes. Oh, well, here, no, not, not if God's turning up that temperature. It says here, you drink, but you're not filled with drink. It ain't working. You clothe yourself, but there's no one warm. You think just cuddling up with a blanket, watching a movie, binging on Netflix takes it away? Nope, that blanket ain't making you warm now. See, when God done turning up the heat, you ain't going nowhere, and your desolation will follow you everywhere you go until you repent and you return and you get on sackcloth. Yeah, it's a convicting word, but this is how you get blessed. And then he says, and the one that wants to earn wages, it says, yeah, you earn wages, but I'll put holes in your bags. All the money fall right out. You don't even know where the money went. You're the biggest penny pincher of them all. All of a sudden now you have no idea where it all went in a blink of an eye. Look, there's no running from God. But guess what? He's so good. He's so loving. He's so beautiful. We should be glad we can't run away from him. Our hearts want to run from light. We want to run the darkness. That's the, that old nature. You can't run from them. And praise God. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Praise God. Now let's keep it moving. We saw the the. Remember I said it's three parts, and this is my first closing. We said it's three parts. The, therefore, and then. The book could be divided into the, therefore, and then. The problem with the church today is they want just the then. They want the then. Oh, then, Joel 2.25, I will restore to you the years the locust has eaten. I will give you back what the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm has eaten. I will give you back the missed harvest. The church just wants to fast forward to the then without looking at the the and without looking at the therefore. You know what that's like? If you play Monopoly, anyone here play Monopoly? You know the two best properties in the game or what? Boardwalk and Park Place. 
What would you do if you sat down to play Monopoly with somebody and they rolled a three? And instead of going and med that little, what are the two worst properties in the game? Baltic and Mediterranean. What would you do if somebody rolled a three? And instead of going to Mediterranean, they, sh they, they shimmied backwards to Park Place. Are, are they allowed to do that? Would they, would that have, oh, you'd allow that in the game? First game, yeah, buy it, I'll buy it. Uh, hotels, and, and then first roll, they go backwards to Park Place. They already got four houses in a hotel on? No, 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 you're on Mediterranean. You're on a place where houses only cost $10, you're not on Park Place, and you, can, and you can't even buy houses until you go around the whole board once. And you got to have the whole color group. That is where the church is when we just want to walk into this Bible, walk into the book of Joel, and just claim Joel 2.25 as a then, just because you done cried, just because 2020's been hard, that somehow we, you see, the problem is we think we deserve something. We, we think God owes us something. No, no, no. He wants to give you the then, but first it's the the. The first two chapters, the. This is the word of the Lord. Then it's a therefore. Look at therefore. Therefore now. Now. Now, now you got the the. Now you ready for the therefore. See, until you know the word of God, you don't even know what to be repenting about when it's time to repent. Until you get the the word of the Lord, you may think you done repented and your repentance was so shallow, an uh, 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 ant could walk through that puddle. No, now that you know the the, now you're ready for the therefore. Therefore, thus says the Lord, turn unto me, look at this, with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and he is merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. He repents of the evil. Verse 14, please underline this. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? You got to underline that verse. And if you're still watching this live, this is when you should sit up, make sure your pen has ink, make sure your highlighter is good. Now it's time to start underlining. That verse is, 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 is unreal. Who knows? Even when King David committed adultery and the first child of Bathsheba was sick and David knew it was all wrong and demonic and tore up from the floor up, but he was praying and they were like, yo, David, why are you praying? You already know God gave a judgment. The child would die young, ba 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 David was like, yo, who knows? God might just bless anyway. You see, that's why David was a man after God's own heart. And this is what we need to get. No matter how bad it is, no matter how much you done messed up, this is a desolation of locusts. This desolation caused desolation everywhere, economically, emotionally. This affected marriages. This affected families. How many marriages are desolate this year? How many relationships, people in the same houses, relationships are desolate? And then just people in the middle of COVID making some of the dumbest decisions in their life out of emotion, self-pity, and everything else, and just, have the, just wow, and it's, oh, man. Look at this. Why do we go to God? Because no matter how much we done messed up, no matter how much desolation we've allowed, who knows if he will change his mind and bless your socks off. That's what the verse is saying. Who knows? And yes, God is immutable. He does not change, Malachi 3.6. But he can will a change. God does not change as far as his character, but God can will a change. You see it happen in Exodus 32, verses 12 through 14. God will, there are certain chastenings that could be coming right down the bowling lane to hit us. There could be certain judgments that could be coming right down the bowling lane to hit us that we know we deserve, and God can will a change if we repent. God can will a change. You could say, I done messed up my life. Might as well just keep wilding out. How many believers are just convinced that they've already made a certain bed and they got a lie in it? This verse is saying, Exodus 32, verses 12 through 14. Jonah, chapter 3, verse 10. Jonah went to the Ninevites. Yo, 40 days, it's going to be nothing but toast in this city. God doesn't change, but when the Ninevites repented, he willed a change. And instead of giving them judgment, he gave the wicked Ninevites revival. Jonah was angry about that, remember? Jonah said, that's why I ran. 
I didn't run because I was scared of ministry. I ran, Lord, Jonah 4, because I know you're gracious. I know you're good. And I knew if these wicked people repented, you would will a change. And I didn't want them to get forgiven. I wanted them to burn. That's why I ran. God, and isn't that good news? Whatever mess you've made in 2020, whatever mess, you can do business with God today and it actually could, he could will a change. He could will an absolute change. Oh, that's why the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. But you got to do the the and you got to do the therefore before you get to the then. Blow a trumpet in Zion, verse 15, is my second closing. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breast, get the babies out. We got to mean business. See, one thing, God knows when a church means business or when it doesn't. He knows when an individual means business or when they don't. Bob Marley said, you can fool some people sometime, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Can't fool God. He knows. To fool your pastor, fool whoever, you can't, you know. But look at this here. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Would you underline that? And this would be my third closing. What's that mean? Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Would you write down Deuteronomy 24, verse 5? Deuteronomy 24, verse 5 said that when a man married a woman, he didn't have to go to war for a year so that he could just tend to his wife right? What it's saying is this is so serious, and God is looking for a repentance from his people. If my people who are called by my name, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven. I will heal them. But what does he say first? If my people will humble themselves and pray, if they'll care enough to humble themselves and pray, what is it saying? This needs to be regarded as something so serious. Will the church begin to realize that this is a crisis hour? Will I realize more that this is a crisis hour? It's saying here, this is such a crisis hour, what he's saying through Joel, that even the husband who was supposed to be left alone for a year, yo, go get him too. You see, that's what it's saying. Deuteronomy 24, 5. He didn't have to go to war for a year. But for this, when it comes to repenting, searching hearts, crying out to God, yo, go get him too. Knock, knock. Sorry, yeah, yo, it's an emergency. Let the priest, verse 17, let the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Verse 18, then, that's the verse. We said there's a the, there's a then, and then there's a, a the, a the, a therefore, and a then. Then, verse 18, will the Lord be jealous for the land and pity his people. How many of y'all want to walk in the then? No matter what's happening, we're 2021, worse, more famine, more desolation. But yo, you're walking in a then. God sees you. God, God's got you. God's, God's not withholding anything good from you. If we want the then, then we got to hear the the and we got to hear the therefore. Verse 23, be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he's given you, look at this, the former rain moderately, and he will even cause to come down on you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. You see, based on Deuteronomy 11, God said, if you're not walking with me, I will withhold rain. What it's saying today is if we're not walking, then I'll withhold my Holy Spirit. Is it just me? And this is convicting for all of us to say, it's hard to find the Holy Ghost when you're looking around today in the lives of people because God withholds the rain as a way to make you say, it's pretty parched. Let me examine my heart and get right with God again. But he says, but if you do, then I will give you the rain again. I'll give you the former rain. I'll give you the latter rain. I'll make it, I'll give you, you'll have Holy Spirit just falling on you when you don't even got to ask. You don't have to read books about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit because I'll just be filling you with the Holy Spirit. And the floors, verse 24, will be full of wheat and the fats will overflow with wine and oil. 
Look at this, and I, look at this, I will restore to you. Now I will restore to you the years. I, now I'll give you missed harvests, missed opportunities, missed blessings, squandered blessings. I'll renew your home. I'll renew your marriages. I'll renew your relationship with your kids. I'll renew your position in your local church. I will give it all back. And then you will say, verse 26, the Lord God has done wondrously with me. The question is, who wants it? So, that's today's message. And may we just come back to falling in love with 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Oh, hallelujah. For correction. Oh, hallelujah. For instruction in righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. And for rebuke. Hallelujah for rebuke. Can y'all say that? When the last time you said hallelujah for rebuke? Hallelujah for a right between the eye, molly wop, wake up this knucklehead, rebuke. Rebuke the snot out of you, rebuke. Because without that, we get weird at record speed. But, it says in the last days, people won't want to hear preaching like this. They'll raise up preachers. And right now, while this is being taught, there's a pastor in another pulpit making people laugh their heads off. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, you're so funny. Yo, I'm a clown. I'm, a, I'm, I'm too much of a clown at times. But I'm not here. To, if driving home, if all I did was heard you say I'm funny, I'd be, I, I would worry about me and, and my preaching style. It's not to be funny. It says in the last days, though, people would want teachers to come up and just scratch their ears. And how'd that message make you feel today? I feel good. I feel good. I feel great. I feel great. I feel great. I, 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 I. And we don't say, how's he feel? How's his heart feel? My desolate life, my desolate life, my desolate life, my desolate life. What about, you could say, the part of his heart that's been desolate because we've not been looking at him, acknowledging him, or looking to walk with him. That's what, a, that's what a sermon's designed to do. A, a sermon should get you looking at God. Not just, oh, yeah, I learned how to deal with my problems more. I learned, oh, my desolation. I, I, me, 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 me. I'm going to be all right. No, what? Are you all right? That's what made Barry and Bethany come in the room and take her spike nard and break it and anoint his body with spike nard with her life savings. Because she was like, how are you? Judah sitting there, oh, that money could have been given to the poor. Well, let me tell you something. When you begin to walk like this, your biggest critics will be those at the Christian table with you. Jesus said, leave her alone. What she's done is going to be a memorial. And did, is it not? Are we not reading about it today? So look, brothers and sisters, I think what a better way to go out of this year is to really see how to really get blessed. First is the the. What's God got to say? Then it's the Therefore. Now I know how to really repent correctly and really do business with God. Then it's the then. Then. Oh, you won't have to tell people you're blessed. They'll see it all over your life. You won't have to tell people. You won't have to post about it. They'll see it all over your life. Then. Missed harvest, squandered opportunities, where you deserve lightning bolts. Nothing but blessings. He wants to do it, but it's got to be his way. Hallelujah. Father, we surrender to you now. We repent of all sin. We repent of ignoring not just the desolation around us, but, but being very callous to the desolation, for lack of a better word, in your heart by us being absentee children, absentee servants, absentee cross carriers, absentee martyrs for you, absentee Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Absentee, not my will, but thine be done. Absentee, search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Absentee, not unto us, not unto us, but to your name we give glory. Lord, thank you for giving us such a word of love. Thank you that Joel is so much like our, our year, 900 years before you would pour out the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, Joel would say, and I will pour out my spirit in the last days, and your young men will prophesy, your young women will prophesy, 
and see dreams and visions. The same Joel. Lord, wow, we're, we're in awe. So Lord, would you just cause us to really search our hearts? We don't want to be the hard-headed person running from the lion just to get the bear and then playing dodgeball all our life just for the serpent on the wall to bite us. And Lord, you told us that way is a hard life. Lord, we want all of what you want for us. We, we repent of making Christianity about us. We repent, Lord, of making this about us. Lord, would you please deliver us? And Lord, in this land, we want to walk in revival. We want to walk in renewal. Thank you for this disaster manual for how to have renewal in the midst of disaster. We love you, Lord. And Lord, would you receive this morning's offering as worship from us to you? Our tithes, our offerings, we give them to you. We're sorry with what we've made, even with giving to you. We're sorry with what we've done with it, Lord. We want to give to you joyfully as worship, as, with, with honor to you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.